Hey everybody, welcome to my video on second degree price discrimination or indirect price discrimination. I'm going to talk a little bit about what this kind of price discrimination is and I'm going to talk about incentive compatibility constraints. I will not be trying to prove any or show any way of choosing an optimal pricing scheme. I'm just going to check incentive compatibility constraints. So let's get to it. First thing, in order to have price discrimination, we need our firm to have market power. They need to be able to prevent resale. And specific to this case, with second degree price discrimination, we need to have different kinds of consumers and the firm cannot see the consumer type. These first two options are required for any pricing schemes. The second two are what bring us to second degree price discrimination. There's different kinds and we can't tell which kind they are when they walk in the store. There are lots of ways to indirectly price discriminate. I intend to focus on two of them, which are creating different versions of your good. That'll be a short, easy example. And a different one with quantity discounts, which will be a little bit more involved. So our goal is to set prices so that members of each group will choose of their own volition the price meant for them. So I want to try to set my prices so that high paying consumers choose the high price and that low paying consumers will choose the low price. And so we're going to rely on this concept called incentive compatibility and incentive compatibility, or as I'm going to call it from now on, is just IC is that you have IC if the groups properly sort themselves into the appropriate pricing, they will self select they will choose the one we want them to go to. If so, then our pricing scheme is incentive compatible. So if we try to get type A consumers to pay price A and type B consumers to pay price B, then incentive compatible means four things. It means that the consumer surplus for consumer A from paying price A is greater than the consumer surplus of type A from paying price B. That's the self-selecting for consumer A. They prefer price A. We also need that the consumer surplus for type A of paying price A is greater than or equal to zero, so that they're willing to pay for it. So it's better than B, and it's better than nothing. Consumer A's in. Similar ones for consumer B. Consumer B with price B is better than consumer surplus for B with price A and it's better than nothing. So this is why getting a full video where I choose ideal situations can be messy because I would be solving an optimization problem with four constraints and I'm a little too lazy to do that for YouTube. Um, I did it for homework in grad school a couple times but I'm not really that interested in doing it again. So if I ever find that homework though, maybe I'll copy it for a video Enjoy it then. So we want it so that each type prefers their own price, like that. And we also want it so that each type wants to buy the good instead of not buying anything. Those are the conditions for incentive compatibility. Now let's get to versioning. Uh, one way to do indirect price discrimination is to create different versions of your good. So we have a firm here that is targeting two kinds of consumers, a budget consumer and a luxury consumer with a basic phone and a fancy phone. And our budget consumer is willing to pay 300 bucks for a basic phone and $330 for a fancy phone. Our luxury consumer is willing to pay 330 for the basic or 440 for the fancy. You can complain about the numbers if you want to. Say the firm chooses a pricing scheme where the basic phone sells for 280 and the fancy phone sells for 380. Is this pricing scheme incentive compatible? Well, we need to calculate the consumer surplus for both people. And if the budget consumer wants the basic phone and the luxury consumer wants the fancy phone, then it is. So consumer surplus for the budget consumer buying basic. They're willing to pay 300, they only pay 280, consumer surplus is 20. For the fancy phone, they're willing to pay 330, they pay 380, consumer surplus is negative 50. They prefer to buy the basic phone. So it's incentive compatible for that consumer. Let's check out the other one now. Consumer surplus for the luxury consumer buying a basic phone is 50. 
consumer surplus for the luxury consumer buying a fancy phone is 60, they prefer the fancy phone. So it's incentive compatible. The blue scheme works. For both of our consumers, they self-sort into the way we want them to be. Now let's try a different version. Let's keep the same basic price, but let's add more to the fancy price. Because, you know, our consumer is willing to pay for 40. Maybe this will be good better. No, I'll show you why not. Okay, so this consumer surplus didn't change. Uh, this one got worse. Our person, our base budget person still wants the basic phone. What about our luxury consumer though? This consumer surplus didn't change, it's still 50. But the other one went down to 30. There's only a $30 difference between willingness to pay and price. So the luxury consumer just got priced so that they'd rather just buy the basic phone. Is this scheme incentive compatible? No, because it does not lead to the sorting that we want. So that's versioning in a nutshell. That's pretty easy, and I think it helps to illustrate this idea of trying to get them to sort themselves out. I want to do a more complicated thing now, which is the quantity discount. Uh, so our customers will pay a high price, pH, if the quantity they buy is less than some Q0, and they'll pay a low price if they buy greater than or equal to Q0, and the high price is greater than the low price. So if we look at their demand curve, here's the high price, and there's the Q1 that they want to buy, here's the low price, and there's Q0. Now a lot of the times you're going to see this weird graph like this where the Q is farther than the low price, like it's out that corner is outside of the demand curve. That's intentional, and we'll get to explain why in just a second. First let me label a few spaces in this graph. There's A, B, and L. Okay, this consumer would probably end up choosing PL and buying Q0 units of the good. Why? If they choose the high price, then they'll buy Q1 units and they'll get consumer surplus of A. If they choose the low price, they'll pick up all of B, that big trapezoid shape, and they're gonna buy a little bit of a good that's outside of their demand curve. They're gonna lose that area L because for those units of the good on that side of the curve, they're paying more than it's worth to them. But the gains for the rest of their transactions outweigh the costs. So because B is greater than L, Consumer surplus from the high price will be less than the consumer surplus from the low price. And so a consumer who looks like this, or a pricing scheme like this, is going to make the consumer buy Q0 at PL. Now, a different version of the same idea. Here's PH and Q1. Here's PL. And there's Q0 way over there. Oof. That's a much bigger corner area. So when you have your A, B, and L, L for loss, notice L is bigger than B now. This person's going to choose the high price, and Q equals Q1, because L is bigger than B, which means their consumer surplus will be higher if they choose the high price instead of the low price. So the way we structure PH and PL tells us whether our consumer is going to go for the quantity discount or not. It all just hinges on which consumer surplus is better. Same like with the versioning. Whichever deal gives them the more surplus. So here's an example. Let's we'll start with a firm with a constant marginal cost of 20. We have two consumers. There's type A with this demand curve, 120 minus 10Q. There's type B with this demand curve, 60 minus 2 Q. Oh, sorry, those are inverse demand curves. Same idea though. We want this person to pay the high price and that person to pay the low price. So here's just a question. Would the following price scheme be incentive compatible? Price is 70 if Q is less than 10. Price is 40 
if q is greater than or equal to 10. All right, remember all those constraints we listed up here? Yeah, we're basically going to do that now. We've got a lot of solving to do. So for type B, we'll start with them because this is the easy one. Here's their demand curve. 60 minus 2Q is their price. Uh, are they ever going to pay 70? No, it's above their willingness to pay. They will never buy high price. Okay. So that means they're going to choose the lower price, if any price. Let's check and see if the lower price is valid. 40 equals 60 minus 2 times Q. 60 minus 20 is 40. Hey, look, it's, it's on or within our demand curve. So they're willing to pay a price of 40 for 10 units of the good. They're not willing to pay 70. This is incentive compatible for person B or type B consumers. They're willing to do it. And the consumer surplus from B is greater than consumer surplus for high price. Yay. Now, what about for type A with this higher demand curve? Well, let's draw it. Here's the price of 70. There's the price of 40. First thing, let's figure out this quantity. I'm just going to plug it into the demand curve. 70 equals 120 minus 10Q implies that Q equals 5. Now let's check 40 and see if we get our discount or not within our demand curve. All right, so I'm finding this Q now. 40 equals 120 minus 10Q. That means that Q is 8. Oh, well, we have to get 10 in order to get the discount. So let's see. Let's add that in there. Extend that 40 out to get 10. So in order to get the discount, we will suffer some sort of a loss for some of our transactions. Uh, just for good measure, I do want, since I'm going to use numbers, I need to know how tall that little L triangle is. And so I want to see where the quantity of 10 meets the demand curve. I need to find this price. Price equals 120 minus 10 times the Q, which is 10, is just 20. So there you go. And now I've got all the information I need to start solving this. Uh, I've got this A, I've got B. Since I drew a firm line at, at the number five, I'm gonna break B up into two pieces now, B and C. And then we've got L down there. So consumer surplus, if they pay a price of 70, is just A. And if they pay a price of 40, is A plus B plus C minus L. L is a loss. All right, so this really hinges on just B, C, and L, since both of them have A in them. This is going to be incentive compatible if consumer surplus for buying 70 is greater than consumer surplus for buying 40. So if A is greater than A plus B plus C minus L, which is if 0 is greater than B plus C minus L, or if L is greater than B plus C. If so then this high paying consumer would rather pay the high price. If not, then we messed up our pricing and they're gonna go for the discount. Let's, count, let's get some numbers in here. Area B is, let's see, that's a rectangle, base times height, so five for the base times 70 minus 40 for the height is 150. Uh, area C, C is a triangle, so half times base times height. The base is 8 minus 5. The height is 70 minus 40. This comes out to 45. What up for L? L is a triangle. Half times base times height. The base is 2, or 10 minus 8. The height is 40 minus 20. That comes out to be just 20. I don't need to calculate A because it's irrelevant. They both have it. Uh, but L is 20, and is 20 greater than 150 plus 45? Of course not. 20 is less than 195. This is not incentive compatible because our high paying consumer is wanting to buy the discounted good. We set our prices wrong. So there you have it. I did one example, a complicated one that's not incentive compatible. And I did these ones where we had both versions of it. It all just hinges on people getting the consumer surplus 
that uh, makes them best off and us setting prices so the type A consumers will pay to get type A prices is so that type B consumers will pay type B prices uh, I know it's a kind of an elementary crash course but it's kind of crazy stuff if you've never seen it before uh, for those of you in grad school have fun with all those different lambdas uh, but yeah thanks for watching guys hope it was helpful good luck and 